I spent a long time, I suppose, with my head in the sand. And then one day I woke up and actually it was the there was an occasion at Sellafield where they lost a year's worth of radioactivity down the pipelines at Sellafield in a day. And it was only discovered because Greenpeace divers were working off the end of the pipeline. And in response to Greenpeace's discovery and various background questions from people like me, the nuclear industry said they had no idea of where that lost material would go or how long it would be in the sea. So that woke me up. I thought, hey, guys, they've been doing this since the 1950s and they're still saying stuff like this in the 1983s. So that motivated me and I started work then, made various submissions at public inquiries about nuclear waste and so on and so on, and was not really criticised on my work, but was criticised on my lack of professional training in the field, so to speak. So I went to university as a mature student and took a degree in marine sciences with a marine pollution option and came out and immediately started campaigning on marine pollution issues, the major one of which was radioactivity. So that's how I started. What's the background on the nuclear issue as you see it that led to this carelessness or this blind spot on the part of the nuclear industry? Good question. Uh, how I see it is that in the late 1940s, there was a, a, a big pressure to complete the building of British nuclear bombs and to produce our own plutonium. And as a result of that, you have to build a reprocessor and you have to have nuclear reactors to produce your byproducts, which you then reprocess into the plutonium for the bomb. So we built Sellafield. As has always been the case in the UK and most other industrial nations as well, there has been a long policy of discharging your surplus wastes to the air or into the nearest water course. And quite naturally enough, the British nuclear industry decided that that's what it would do with some of its what they like to call low level liquid radioactive wastes, it built a pipeline and started discharging them. Now, this was in a situation where it had never been done before with radioactivity. So a hypothesis was concocted with the assistance of the International Atomic Energy Agency and US and British um, experts who were working in the field. And they came up with a hypothesis about how radioactivity would behave in marine environments. But unfortunately, this was done in a pretty total absence of understanding of the way pollutants in general behave in marine environments. And don't forget, in the late 40s, we'd just come through a war. There hadn't been an awful amount of oceanography going on because the oceans were dangerous places to be. And it's quite evident when you read the interchange of letters between oceanographers and the Ministry of Supply who were running all of this in the UK, that oceanographers weren't really very happy about trying to predict how radioactivity behaved in the marine environments because, of course, it hadn't been put in there before and nobody had been studying it. Likewise, the understanding of the way radioactivities behaved once they were loose in the environment was equally poor. So they had to concoct this hypothesis. They did so. And a decision was made in the UK to start discharging radioactivity into the marine environment from reactors and reprocessors and nuclear fuel factories and so on and so on. And that decision, as it happens, was not a democratic decision. It wasn't put before Parliament. As I understand it, I've not been able to nail this particular research trail down completely. But as I understand it, it was what was called an order in council, which is equivalent to an executive decision by the leadership without discussing it with MPs in Parliament or, as I say, having any form of democratic vote or referendum. And the public hadn't really been acquainted with the facts or the lack of facts of the situation about discharges. So the hypothesis was put up, considered to be safe, and the discharges commenced and away we went. We know that that was all a bit of an experiment because in 1958, one of the leaders of the United Kingdom Atomic Energy Authority actually in a public speech referred to the recent long-term experiments on discharging radioactivity into water and what a lot of useful information they got. Eventually, on the basis of the, the, the everybody accepting the hypothesis that had no evidential background, a decision was taken to approve and permit the discharges of liquid radioactive waste into UK coastal waters. Is this the way yeah. other countries deal with their nuclear waste as well? 
Well, I'm not sure because my researches outside the UK are still in a fairly early day. And I don't know how those decision making processes were made in other countries. So I can't help your listeners and, and viewers there. What was the academic background to the original UK government permitting of liquid radioactive waste discharges to the sea? Surprisingly, quickly, this hypothesis about the way radioactivity would behave in the marine environment actually became an orthodoxy. And you found very quickly that people were emerging from nuclear science departments of universities, having been taught that uh, the hypothesis was correct. And then, of course, there's an additional confusion because naturally enough, the people emerge from university with their degrees in nuclear sciences and enter the nuclear industry. And you get people then, after a certain amount of seniority has been achieved in the nuclear industry, they get seconded to be government advisors. And you can go through the UK regulatory agencies, people like our Environment Agency, and you can see that the people who regulate the nuclear industry are ex-nuclear industry apparatchiks who've been taught this orthodoxy and still adhere to it, despite the fact that it's beginning to look a bit shaky, which I hope we shall be able to go into in in a little while. And the hypothesis, again, just to repeat it, is that it is perfectly safe to discharge what they are calling low-level radioactive waste into the marine environment with no monitoring and no checking to find out what the impact actually is. Would that be an accurate retelling of it? Partially. There is monitoring going on, and we'll get into that in a minute. But the, the initial thing is that the hypothesis itself proposed that soluble radioactive materials discharged down the pipeline would dilute and disperse to levels that were either classed as infinity or background, and that insoluble radioactivity that was in the liquid waste would go down the pipeline and bond to the sediments around the end of the pipeline and remain there immobilized and, nice phrase, sequestered from human beings, um, and so everything would be perfectly safe. So on the basis of that, there were a series of general assumptions which were made, which instructed the construction of a monitoring program. And the, the general assumption was, as you, if you follow back to what I just said, was that the highest levels in the marine environment would be near the point of discharge, because after that, it's diluting and dispersing or getting locked the seabed sediments and it's immobile. Doses and exposures to sea discharge radioactive waste would only deliver doses via seafoods, marine work like being a fisherman or, you know, working on oil rigs and so on and so on, um, sportsmen and anglers and sailors and people like this, surfers and windsurfers who might fall in and drink a bit of the water and be irradiated that way, and people on the beach, and that they were the only people to worry about, and it was only really necessary to worry about them close to the discharge points, and therefore you end up with this construction. So the the major dose pathways are close to the discharge points. The only coastal critical groups, which are these people who might receive the highest levels of marine radioactivity, occur close to the discharge points. And aquatic environment monitoring was constructed in order to monitor those people and the environment immediately next to them. So how is marine radioactivity monitored in the United Kingdom? Okay, well, in the UK, we seem to be doing better than uh, certainly is in the case with Fukushima at the moment. And what happens in the UK is that they do take seafood samples, but for each discharge point, looking at the groups um, and the seafoods which are captured near the discharge point, they only take a couple of samples a year. So you maybe have two or three fish samples in a year and you analyse them given that, say, let's say that a pressurised water reactor discharges somewhere between 50 and 60 radionuclides. You for commonly in the UK, you will find that fish will be analysed for maybe seven or eight nuclides. So you've got a whole swathe of radioactive isotopes which are not being studied at all. So that's for the fish. Of course, they do similar work with shellfish. They monitor the seawater off the end of the pipeline, and um, they'll monitor sediments in the immediate area of the discharge point, but nothing further afield, and very poor levels um, of study. I mean, if you were going to take a sample, a questionnaire of people in the street, in, 
in a town with 5,000 people, you wouldn't ask three people. So I don't think that doing two samples of fish a year is really going to give you a good coverage. Equally so, I don't think that taking samples of sediments once a year is actually going to tell you what's happening on a year-round basis in those sediments because, as we will see later on, sediments can be disturbed by tides and big waves and storm action, and there are all sorts of mechanisms for moving radioactivity around. So the studies that they're doing are really inadequate because they are based on a false hypothesis. So having come up with a false hypothesis, they have then monitored in order to confirm the false hypothesis. And they haven't bothered to stretch their ambit of research very much further away than the discharge points. Then with the in what I consider to be the inadequate data that they gather, they then construct hypothetical models of the doses being received by the critical group. So you've got inadequate data going into a false hypothesis model. Um, and then, of course, the inevitable conclusion is that everybody is perfectly safe and nobody is at risk of any untoward doses. They've got it all covered. They understand what's happening. And despite the steady accruing of independent evidence to the contrary, um, a contrary to the hypothesis, they stick by that policy now. And even with the, you know, even with the monitoring that's going on at Fukushima, the International Atomic Energy Agency most recent report on Fukushima, one of its technical addendums actually refers to dilute and disperse as if that's the only way that radioactivity behaves. But here in the UK and elsewhere where independent, non-nuclear funded academic and research work is going on, the evidence is showing the contrary. I forget which interview this was, but I learned through my research that there really is no such thing as dilution of radioactivity. There is dispersion, but as long as those molecules, as long as those atoms are still intact, they can go down to a single one, and it is still dangerous as opposed to something mm. like a poison that will dilute to the point where it is no longer of danger. Yes, you're, you're, you're pretty much right. I mean, all you need is one speck of radioactive sediment contaminated, particularly with one of the alpha emitters like a plutonium or an americium, to get into your system by eating it or inhaling it or swallowing it, if you happen to fall into the water and swallow a mouthful of something nasty, then you're quite right, it can cause untold damage. And the, anyway, the theory of dilute and disperse, we can look at this later on, but it's been proved to be complete falsehood, really. What are the doses received by UK populations from marine radioactivity? By and large, as far as you can tell from the official monitoring, the doses are low, and this is why it carries on and everybody, objectors, get sort of trounced in public inquiries and told not to be hysterical. And, you know, the industry has all the info. Don't worry, the doses that we model from the bad data tell us that the doses are all very low. But if we, perhaps later on we'll look at one of the case studies and I can illustrate that for you and, and, and show you just, just, just how, how crazily wrong they are. You recently published an article in The Ecologist that talks a lot about sea to land transfer mechanisms. What are these and how do they operate? Well, a little bit of information has come out from the nuclear industry on this, but the vast body of the work, which is really important and really serious, um, is coming from, again, from independent non-nuclear funded sources. And what that demonstrates quite adequately is that both soluble and insoluble radioactivities can travel enormous distances and still be detectable. So they don't dilute and disperse to infinity. I mean, you know, people, people in Europe are well aware of the fact that you can trace Sellafield derived soluble and insoluble radioactivity all the way up the Norwegian coast and entering in the Arctic. And I have read papers which imply that Sellafield-derived plutonium, americium and cesium can be detected emerging from the Arctic between Alaska and Russia. 
So its ability to travel enormous distances and still be detected is plain and evident. The next problem is that we find that actually both forms of radioactivity, the solubles and the insolubles, can reconcentrate quite markedly in fine sediments at the top end of estuaries. Now, commonly in the UK, the ministries are responsible for the work, monitor at the mouth of the estuaries, but we've been able to show repeatedly that if you go to the top end, the landward end of the estuary, where conditions are ripe for the deposition of large areas of fine sediment deposits like mud flats and salt marshes and so on, in those places you find that radioactivity is 10 times higher than it is at the mouth of the estuary. Now, this is one of the things that I've been campaigning on for many years and pointing out to all and sundry that you can do this and you can show you've got this much greater levels in the inland end of the estuary and the British government wants to take no notice. And certainly beginning to look around at US and European monitoring, they would appear at first glance to be adopting the same policy. So we have reconcentration in estuarine sediments. So if you've got your sediments building up radioactivity, then you can have the radioactivity brought ashore, say, if you have a storm surge. There was a town in North Wales, which we shall look at later on, where they had a storm surge. They had about 500 tonnes of marine sediment deposited into the town, the, the caravan parks, the shopping centre and so on and so on, and that had radioactivity in it. So that's another mechanism. In addition to the inundation, the coastal flooding, which incidentally happens all over the place in the UK, especially now with climate change kicking in and increasing storminess in the winter. We've had some terrible winters and some big coastal floods. And I've tried to get uh, British agencies to investigate the radiological impact of those coastal floods and the rubbish that they bring in from the sea. But nobody wants to know. Nobody wants to look at it. However, there was one example where some bright spark individuals took their own samples and paid for an analyst to have a look at them and we'll we'll talk about that later but meanwhile the next and possibly the most important mechanism for sea to land transfer occurs in sea spray and marine aerosols which are generated in the surf zone and because of various mechanisms that occur in the process of creating sea spray and marine aerosols you get tremendous enrichments of the radioactivity so that Irish sea marine aerosols can be shown to concentrate things like plutonium and americium by above 400 times over the levels in the ambient seawater. So that's a very significant enrichment factor, especially when you think in the context of something like Chernobyl or Fukushima and the very huge amounts that have been discharged there. So in sea sprays, you get this major enrichment occurring and you also have quite significant inland penetrations of this radioactivity in the sea sprays and the marine aerosols. And of course, electrical engineers who, who work on utility lines might be aware of the fact that you can find sea salt up to 100 miles inland, coating electrical wires and causing transmission breakdown. Uh, and that's a loose idea for you of the, the potential inland penetration of, of marine products in onshore winds. And it may well be the case that that is happening with radioactivity, only as far as I know, again, an independent non-nuclear study did look as far inland as 10 miles and there they found marine radioactivity, which had been blown ashore. And that's the case we'll talk about later on. I live in Southern California. And as you're talking about this, I think of what we refer to as the morning marine layer that always comes in off the Pacific Ocean yeah. and penetrates a yeah. certain distance inland before it dissipates. So you're saying yeah. that it is entirely possible that if there is radiation present in the ocean water, it will also be present or it can also be present in the marine layer. It will be, yes. If you're talking about a marine layer in terms of a sea fog or marine dampness that's being blown ashore and it's been generated from the marine environment, if there is radioactivity in the water column from which that material has been born, it will be enriched to levels higher than it is in the water column, depending on which isotope it is and so on. Give listeners some examples of case studies of these mechanisms. In 1990, there was a, a big storm in the Irish Sea, which also involved a storm surge, and a small holiday town on the north coast of Wales, 
was inundated. This was a place called Tauin. It was flooded from the sea, extensive flooding of the coastal strip, um, houses, caravans, business premises, public spaces were flooded and contaminated with large amounts of silt from the offshore marine environment several hundred tons it was estimated to be. Now, as I said earlier, the, the authorities weren't particularly interested in this, but a bright spark local individual took 14 samples of this sediment from different parts of his town and together with friends, they clubbed together and, you know, no doubt put on gigs and so on to raise the money to pay for the radio analysis. They sent it off to a laboratory and had a consultant analyse it for them. And he replied with the information that over 50 percent, um, eight out of 14 of those samples tested positive for the alpha actinide americium 241 and actually commented that the levels of americium 241 in the positive sediments exceeded by 10 times what we call in the UK the generalised derived limit. That's a, a kind of an action level when, you, you know, alarms are rung in government and official agencies. Only, unfortunately, in this case, it wasn't. Alarms weren't rung because this was an independent person who'd done this. And although they struggled to publicise it through their local papers and so on and so on, the authorities took no notice. The consultant in this case actually also stated that given the context of the presence of the americium 241, undoubtedly there would have been plutonium there in the sediments as well. And he also stated that when the sediments dry out, there was a possible risk of radiation hazard due to the inhalation of radioactive dust. So that was one case study for inundation. How long ago was this? And has there been any kind of follow-up, even done by citizen oh. activists, not only for the sediment, but on cancer levels? Is there any epidemiological evidence for cancers, specifically, quote unquote, rare cancers showing up in the people of this town? No, as far as I know, nobody's done an epidemiological study. Uh, certainly the government have not because they're denying, they're in denial about all of this anyway. They don't want to know. No, no. Well, this occurred in 1990, and ever since then, whenever we've had heavy storms, um, I or various colleagues have written to the Environment Agency and regional governments saying, oh, why don't you take some samples and check them out for radioactivity because of the example that I've just quoted to you? And um, we don't even get letters back. So people aren't, you know, the authorities aren't interested in checking this. And as you remarked earlier, this is something that is common to all of us when we deal with our nuclear industries and our pro-nuclear governments. They don't really want to know anything that disturbs their happy status of telling everybody that it's all OK. Independent work in West Wales looked at radioactivity uh, across a, a phase of environments. And a, a lot of West Wales is coastal. So they were looking in the coastal zone and 10 miles inland, they found that they had marine radioactivity deposited out on pasture grass. And that's all that their report said, because this was done by our local county government, but not associated with the national government at all. So, so what that implied was that if it was on the pasture grass, then it was inevitably entering the dairy and the meat stock food chain. And um, one can also then extrapolate along that line and say, well, Pretty certain then that anybody growing vegetables or potatoes or, you know, vegetable material or, or arable crops was also going to be harvesting crops that had marine radioactivity deposited out on them. So therefore, you realize that actually there's a risk of a dietary dose of marine radioactivity from land foods. And as I pointed out to you earlier on, the, the orthodox position is that the only dietary doses people will receive from marine radioactivity is from seafoods. But now we have this alternative thing. And then but really the most important point to remember about that is that if you've got the stuff blowing ashore and depositing on vegetables and so on and so on, then obviously it's potentially available for inhalation as well. Because your coastal populations are walking around in that airstream and breathing it in. So there are, there's a potential there. So there's a definite dietary dose and an almost certain but not yet proved inhalation dose. Now, the problem that we have as campaigners is we don't have the money and the resources that the government have. So we're all if we want to do radiological analysis, we have to hold a jumble sale or a bring and buy or put on gigs. And it takes ages to raise any money. And 
then it's often not enough anyway. So the nuclear industry have got all the cards here, and we're struggling along with our little bits of information. You mentioned before that there was an even more important study that was done about sea to land transfer. Tell us about that one. This occurred in the islands off the west coast of Scotland, and it was before Chernobyl, so there was no Chernobyl influence on this at all. And what happened there was a group of doctors who had access to national health funding for their research, and also they had good contacts with the Kilbride Reactor Centre, which is a centre of nuclear study in Scotland. They took patients and they decided that they would analyse their diet and compare and contrast the difference between people who are living on this island who ate strictly locally produced food and the diets of people who ate what was called ship food because it was all brought in for the island supermarkets by ship so none of it was produced locally and what they discovered in their researches was that the whole island was saturated with marine radioactivity in this case derived from cellarfield discharges it was all it's only a small island it's only 15 miles uh, in circumference so it was a small island but it was saturated with radioactivity and all the foodstuffs were also, locally grown foodstuffs were also saturated with radioactivity. So the really crucial thing about this study was that for the first and only time in the UK, people were actually empirically studied. So people were sent to the reactor centre in Kilbride to have whole body radiation monitoring. People's urine was analysed for radioactivity content and all their dietary input was also analysed for radioactivity content. So they actually got an empirical dose out of that as opposed to the hypothetical and modelled doses that the UK authorities have. Now, they found what was found by these doctors was that the population of the island who ate locally produced food in greater abundance than shop food had higher doses than the shop food people. So that nailed your dose exposure down to something on the island diet. Then they tore into the various things and they discovered that actually the person who had the highest radiation dietary doses ate no fish. So he was getting marine radioactivity only through his terrestrial food, OK? And his seafood was insignificant because he wasn't eating any. But even people who were eating seafood were still getting bigger doses from their land food, which had been contaminated with marine radioactivity as a result of sea to land transfer. Now, these doses were quite small because we're not dealing with something like Fukushima. And also this particular island was 200 miles away from Sellafield. 200 miles from Sellafield, these people from their one isotope, so it was only talking about cesium-137 here that was measured, okay? So they were getting bigger doses in their land food of marine radioactivity than people living next to point sources were receiving from multiple nuclides from their seafood. So you can look at a site like Wolva on the North Wales coast where seafoods were being monitored for 10 radioactive isotopes and their seafood dose that those people were receiving adjacent to that nuclear site was lower for, you know, the aggregated 10 isotopes than the people on the Hebridean island were receiving from the one isotope in their land food. So this completely disproved the hypothesis that marine radioactivity, you can only get a dietary dose of through eating seafoods. And it's quite evident that actually significant amounts of marine radioactivity are being consumed in terrestrial foods following sea to land transfer. Now, this is something that was observed in the 1980s and through the 1990s. And ever since then, I, for one, and certainly colleagues of mine have been campaigning very loudly, doing newspaper articles and TV interviews, trying to interface with the agencies about this, but they don't want to know. They prefer to adopt a policy of lofty disdain I've seen all of this now knock on into the monitoring that the Japanese government are doing at Fukushima. This is exactly where I wanted to go next. Given the extensive research you have already done and what you know about what happens to radiation in the marine environment, how does this relate 
to Fukushima and the way the Japanese governmental agencies have been or have not been monitoring Fukushima marine radioactivity discharges. I initially had a look at the monitoring protocol published and printed by the Japanese government, and it sets it all out there, what the intentions are and what they will do, and also makes a point of saying that during this process they had um, communications with the International Atomic Energy Authority, and the IAEA basically said, good on you, this is the way to go, do what you're doing, and as I mentioned earlier, referenced this false hypothesis of dilute and disperse. So what, what the Japanese decided to do was to monitor the marine water, monitor seafood diet, but when you look at it, you then start to, you know, when you tear into it and start to look at the maps and the details, you realise that actually they're not monitoring near the coast at all. The nearest monitoring site that I could find to the coast was about two or three kilometres offshore. So all these things that you and I have just been talking about these issues of sea to land transfer couldn't be captured by the Japanese monitoring because what they did was, I guess, probably cutting costs, probably cutting effort, following their orthodoxy, which they have already established, which we now understand just gives them the results that they want to get. So what they're doing is they're monitoring offshore. They're only monitoring for the alphas like plutonium or americium within kind of 20 miles of the end of the pipeline. Well, the discharge area from the Fukushima disaster. And we know, as I said to you earlier on, you know, you, you can find Sellafield derived plutonium in the Arctic. So 20 miles is just messing around in a puddle, really. It's not really looking seriously and applying appropriate scientific rigor to the study of the behavior of alphas in the marine environment. For the other radionuclides, they tended to concentrate on cesium and iodine and a little bit, a little bit looking at strontium at greater distances. But again, nothing has been done on the coast. Now, what we discern in the UK is that actually the serious threat from marine radioactivity is to coastal populations as a result of the phenomena that I've just talked about. For instance, we talk about coastal inundation. There has recently been a tropical storm, Etai, on the, the Pacific coast of Japan, which involved quite a lot of coastal inundation. And from the current way that the Japanese are monitoring, nobody is going to look to see if any contaminated water or contaminated sediment flooded into those low-lying coastal areas that were flooded, and whether there's any radioactivity there for people who may not have been affected by the fallout from the atmospheric plume. Now, we know a lot about the areas that were affected by the atmospheric plume and the people who are exposed and indeed they're being studied and some of them are having radiation monitoring done in a very minor way because japan really doesn't want to know they're doing everything they can to discourage individual doctors from doing any kind of examinations based on radiation but go ahead about the way that the studies oh, okay. are being done well, well well, just, just to back that up, as you implied earlier on, you know, there, there is a certain amount of, again, independent epidemiological evidence in the UK to suggest that you do find very interesting clusters of cancers in the appropriate coastal areas where you've got lots of marine sediment, where you've got onshore winds and where you've got this sea spray and marine aerosoling taking place and where you have coastal inundations that you do tend to find. Now, of course... Actually, apportioning the cause to those is an argument which is never finished because the, the forces of the nuclear industry and, and others put enormous effort to refute those arguments. So it, it's very difficult. But the point is that there are cancer clusters all up and down the Irish Sea coast in areas which would appear, by my reckoning, to be areas that are suffering from various forms of sea to land transfer. And it's very interesting to note that a lot of these are on our west coast where we have our prevailing winds. So the Pacific coast of Honshu, where the Fukushima marine plumes was drifting up and down in response to various marine dynamics, is also exposed to onshore trade winds for a large part of the year. So they're going to be an area which is almost certainly, no, I would say, no, I wouldn't hedge my bets. I would say that if you looked there, you would find that you had sea to land transferred radioactivity from the Fukushima plume and that given the enormous aggregated radioactivity which we still haven't adequately quantified and which has got into the sea and also the ex enormously extended chronological time of such high level discharges it must be that if you've got enrichments of 
up to 400 times occurring when you have sea to land transfer mechanisms operating people along that coastal strip somewhere or other where the conditions are appropriate will be receiving significant doses which may be additional to what they've already had from atmospheric deposition but they may be doses that they have not received from any other source other than from the marine source and the sea to land transfer mechanisms taking place. So I think that the British experience is bad enough, but at least we haven't had to suffer a Fukushima. And I think in the context of the enormity and magnitude of the Fukushima disaster, Japanese government and the International Atomic Energy Agency are really pulling their punches and hiding their heads in the sand. And I'll tell you what, later on, when people come to start to try and correlate the impact of the Fukushima disaster in terms of public health, they will look at the cancer incidences, for instance, in the areas known to have suffered from atmospheric deposition. And they will say, oh, yes, well, here's, you know, we've got so many per thousand or whatever there. But then I think because of the sea to land transfer mechanisms, you're going to have another population who aren't recognized currently as being exposed to significant levels of radioactivity. They, too, will have the health effects which will be generated by their dietary and possibly inhalation doses. And that will foul up the whole issue because this will be seen as being an area, there is no record of radioactivity here, purely on my understanding, because the work wasn't done. And then when people are trying to contrast and compare, people will say, oh, well, look, in these areas, we've got quite high radioactivities of the same sort as well. But there's no evidence that there was any radioactivity here. The atmospheric plume did not fall on it, on these people in these areas, and the marine radioactivity all diluted and dispersed, as per IAEA would have you believe. But we know from the UK experience that this isn't the case. Those mechanisms do operate, and people are exposed, and people receive higher doses of dietary radioactivity from their land food, then that radioactivity is being transported from the sea and deposited onto the land. They receive higher doses through that mechanism than they do through the eating of seafood or the paddling in the sea. So the Japanese authorities have really been very lax. I would call it a derelict, well, as I said in my article, I call it a dereliction of duty, a, a lack of scientific rigor, and a refusal to explore new avenues, which is what science and research ought to be about, really. And what I'm reflecting on is the fact that they always say, well, we don't know if the cancer rates in Fukushima are so terrible because we don't know what the comparable cancer rate is in the rest of Japan. But what you're saying is that this is a flood of radiation that will float all boats to a higher level. They'll still be able to get away with that argument. They just won't understand why all of the numbers for the entire country, or at least the entire marine area, are being increased. I suspect that some of them will understand that very well. It looks now really as if maybe almost as much radioactivity has got into the sea as got into the atmosphere. We don't really understand how reactor accidents work in terms of what they discharge and what they don't discharge. We've never had an event like this off the Japanese coast, so nobody's been able to study these things before. So it's all a hypothesis, but it does seem quite inevitable that vast quantities of radioactivity are in the sea. So the effects that we see in the UK are going to be much, much heightened in Japan because the sheer amount of radioactivity being discharged into the marine environment is so enormous. And I do think, you know, that those lost statistics in those coastal areas which will be affected will actually be allowed or will, will help to skew the statistics that come out about radiation-linked illnesses and the incidents in areas known to suffer Tim, this has been a mind-blowing interview with you to get this information and understand the mechanism by which it transfers inland. That's extremely important, not only in Japan and, of course, in the UK, but here in the United States, where we think we're immune to this, and there's a tiny mm. amount of study being done of seafood and kelp, but I don't know of anything that's being done on this particular angle. So I know that this interview is going to be 
met with an intense amount of interest by a lot of people, including some organic farmers we know who are involved in our movement. For now, Tim Deer Jones, I want to thank you for being my guest this week on Nuclear Hot Seat. Thank you for the opportunity to share my desk and field research findings with you and your listeners. Bless you all. That was Tim Deer Jones. We will have a link up to some of his articles and a means of contacting him on our website, nuclearhotseat.com, under this episode, number 271.